So I have no financial disclosures, as we have said. Um, our objectives, we're just going to kind of take a broad look at pediatrics, and then we're going to drill down into some different areas about what we can do as primary care providers, what we um, hope our subspecialists can help us with, um, talk about what's really happening with the evidence around pediatric obesity, and discuss what's happening with medication, surgery, and behavioral approaches, because there's a lot happening with all of them. Um, first and foremost, I am a general pediatrician. Um, as Deb mentioned in my little brief bio there, I am a founder of a pr practice in Northern Kentucky, Pediatric Associates, um, which um, we have a lot of, we're a very active group, about 14 uh, pediatricians, um, several um, uh, advanced practice folks. We have three offices. Um, we serve the Northern Kentucky area and our catchment area actually spills into Ohio and into Indiana as well. Um, I am a general pediatrician, but I also have this stint for about three years when I went back to Children's to become the weight management uh, center director at, at Children's. It was sort of this leftover piece of my, of my life that I, right after residency, that I never completed due to some family things. And it was a wonderful opportunity, and that's why I stay involved in pediatric obesity. Um, I'm the former chair of the section on obesity. I was lucky enough to help get that started, um, which has been a great place. If you're looking for resources around pediatric obesity, the section is a great place to belong to at the AAP. A special interest in young kids where I've done most of my research um, at, in conjunction with the behavioral health folks at Cincinnati Children's. Um, but then I've also got a fair amount of experience with bariatric surgery. Um, in my role at Children's, I was the pediatrician on that team. Um, if you had to say, what is your personal quest? It is to empower my fellow primary care pediatricians and really all primary care pediatric providers, NPs, PAs, to help their patients manage their obesity. Um, and really to, um, I had a, a colleague once describe it saying, you know, this is not about what I want for you. This is not about um, necessarily even weight loss. This is about making you the happiest and healthiest you can be. Uh, so that's our goal. And I think that's important to keep that in mind. Um, one of the things I always, that I always hesitate about talking about is I definitely view pediatric obesity as a chronic disease. Um, and like a lot of people in this field, I have a personal history with it, both in family and individually. And there's a lot of us who do, and I think that's okay to talk about that at times because I think it gives you some credibility sometimes with your patients if you don't overdo it. So first off, let's take a little journey back in time. Uh, this has been a process that we've all been dealing with for a long, long time. And many of you, I'm sure, remember these slides. These are from the Centers for Disease Control. And what these are looking at is our obesity trends among US adults from 1990 to 2000 to 2010. That's when we really saw the er earliest indications. The earliest indications really were 1990. Um, when we started seeing some, some places begin to increase uh, weight status amongst the adult population. Um, we, we always say like, okay, what does this mean? Like, you know, when we have people over the 90, when we have 10% of the people over the 95th percentile, you know, we always said, well, well, isn't that by definition the 90th percentile of 10% of the people are over there? Remember, these are the numbers that were set by the growth curves in, 19, in the mid 1970s. So in the 90s was when we first started seeing things sort of diverge from that. By 2000, it was obvious things were really trending in the wrong direction. By 2010, um, we started seeing rates uh, that we see currently where a third of the adult population has obesity, a third has an overweight status, and a third are at what considered normal weight status. That's among adults. Among children, the numbers are in flux, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means very shortly, um, but they are very similar, and it's the same areas amongst kids and adults that suffer the most. It's the Deep South, um, it's parts of the Midwest. It also appeared, you know, back in those days, I remember being a pediatrician at those point, uh, having done this for over 30 years. I remember we would always get these kids who came in and people would say like, you know, you have to do something about this child. We have a 95 pound four-year-old in the office. I'm like, what well, I, you know, is like only the very most extreme cases would present and come to people's attention. And 
it, it was really frustrating because you just did not know exactly what to do. Is this a, so I used to give a talk about how it might, is this a social service issue? Is this like the converse of, of failure to thrive? These kids need, you know, hospitalization to get this under control. Um, we had very few tools. I mean, it was just like, we just don't know what to do. You know, we would say things like eat less and exercise more. Well, great. That's, that you said that to everybody. These are not tailored. These are not tailored um, uh, interventions. It was one thing for everybody. And we know that does not work. We referred wherever we could. In Cincinnati, that meant we referred to cardiology. Uh, they were the ones, there was a, a doc who was now the, the chair of the department in, in Denver, Steve Daniels. And he um, had an interest in pediatric obesity, one of the few people in the country who did at that time in the early 90s. And so we would refer to cardiology uh, or we'd refer to endocrinology in certain institutions, gastroenterology um, because of issues with liver disease in kids with obesity. Um, we would refer to general academic pediatric centers who happen to have programs. Um, oops. I think my screen quit share, resume share. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, we would go through community programs if they existed. We would use commercial programs um, at different points as well. You know, people would just say, well, let's try this or that if it was available. Um, and the really sad thing about all this was hardly anything worked. Um, we really had, we really struggled with pediatric obesity. There just were not a lot of good outcomes that we could share with folks. Um, and that caused problems, um, a new number of problems. In 2007, an AAP statement came out and a lot of people felt like this was the first guideline on what to do. Well, the unfortunate thing was it was not a guideline. Uh, this was expert opinion, um, great experts, but it was all expert opinion. There was really not a lot of data there. There was not a lot of evidence that you could point to and say, this worked, this, this does not work. Um, algorithms came out of it um, because it was sort of an algorithm based. It didn't come out initially as an algorithm, but a lot of us adapted algorithms to reflect what was in that expert opinion statement. Um, and there were always questions. Is this implementable? Is it effective even? Um, so there were a lot of questions about it and a lot of lack of data around it. And that's 15 years ago. So all this area of uncertainty led us to this decade of challenges. Fortunately, we had our 15 minutes of fame. Unfor unfortunately, it was only 15 minutes of fame. Um, I think we quickly got displaced. You know, people were very much um, uh, uh, alert to it for a while, and then it seemed to fade to the back burner. Thank goodness Michelle Obama picked it up um, and kept it in front of people for a bit longer, but it seemed like people have kind of forgotten about it. Um, their reimbursement challenges continued um, because we couldn't prove uh, outcomes. Um, there was movement toward making obesity a disease, which I think is a very important development, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. Um, and programs, the sad thing about this was programs for pediatric obesity opened in response to these scary, scary numbers, and then oftentimes promptly closed because they couldn't make themselves financially even neutral. Um, I was very fortunate. Cincinnati Children's has a very long running program going now called HealthWorks that's been around really since the early 90s when Steve Daniels started it. It's been through a couple of medical directors, me and currently Bob Siegel, who runs it, great doc. Um, but a lot of places, these kinds of programs opened and then closed because they could not crack the nut on how to make this work financially for the institution. Unfortunately, one of those ones happened here at, in, in Louisville. Um, but big ones also in Michigan and lots of other places. And then we had a pandemic, in case you forgot about that, um, especially hard on our patients. Um, you know, rates increased in all age groups, um, spikes in both prevalence and severity. It's been worst, we think, and I'm gonna show you some slides on this in just a second. It was worst in youngest patients and those already with obesity. Um, as we know, COVID in patients with obesity is especially um, tough because we think that there may be um, difficulty 
with um, uh, the fat cells being infected by COVID. I wanna take a second here to take a look at different, um, um, uh, I'm going to, wait, this is the challenge of broadcasting at home. My dog is going nuts. I'm going to go close the door and I'll be right back. Ah, oh, the joys of presenting at home. So um, let's take a second to get oriented to these charts. So what we have here are four charts, and these are thanks to our amazing colleagues at the CDC Center for um, Nutrition, Healthy Activity, and Obesity. Um, one of the people who runs that is a Louisville native, Ali Goodman, um, and this division does fantastic, fantastic work um, in this area. Um, if we look here on our, on our charts, these are um, rates of pediatric obesity, um, and with the start of the COVID pandemic marked on each of these charts, and these are different age groups. So this first group, age three to five, age six to 11, age 12 to 17, age 18 to 20. And the individual lines represent different levels of, of obesity. Um, and so what we can see is that basically all levels increase the most. And if you notice this three to five range, the slope is most severe here, a little less severe here, a little less here, and more of a flat line over here with their kids with severe obesity, this being this heavy, this, this darker solid blue line. But really the kids getting the most effect of this uh, pandemic, unfortunately, are the ones with severe obesity and our younger kids. Now, let me orient you to these. So think about these charts. The first charts here, are, this one is hospitalization. This one is ICU, and these two are ICU admissions. These two are use of mechanical ventilation, and these two are death as an outcome. The top ones are smoothed out with all the different age groups not parsed out. So you can see basically um, hospitalization rates go up as BMI increases. Okay, that's the, 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 general, the general rule here. I mean, certainly, you know, at very low BMIs when they're for, for other reasons, um, that also is, is a risk factor. But really in general, what we're looking at here is increasing BMI increases rates of all of these outcomes. When we break it down by age group, what we see is, you know, that there's also some variation with ages. And again, it's the younger kids have greater, um, um, have, have more of an effect in this area. Um, and what we really see is that, um, that, that, again, that in all age groups um, across the spectrum, increasing BMI has, the take home messages, B, increasing BMI um, increases adverse outcomes with COVID. So now that we're all completely bummed out about what's going on, it's time to look up. Um, all is not lost. Uh, medicine makes progress, um, and there's been a lot of progress. Behavioral interventions are much more sophisticated. Surgery has demonstrated positive outcomes. Medications are becoming more available for treatment of obesity. There are advances in prevention. And one thing I think is a really big issue that's happening, and I so said I was going to get back to this, but we as providers are getting our act together because of a paradigm shift in obesity care. And what's that paradigm shift? Obesity is now considered a disease. And I think that's very important. That has a lot of important implications. Um, it's a chronic disease as well, which means it gets us out of, of some of the ways we used to think about obesity as you know, almost the biggest loser thing. You would lose weight and then you're fixed and then off you go back to your regular life. No, we don't think about it that way, nor should we think about it that way. Obesity is a disease, it's a chronic disease, and it needs to be managed that way. It should take us away from blaming and shaming about the fact we don't th that you have it. We don't like, tell people you're, you know, you have value judgments because they have hypertension or value judgments because they have cancer. Um, it takes us away from blaming and shaming. And it also, we think, I think gives patients a more realistic idea about what control is versus cure. I talk about this a lot of with my patients who've had success. 
is that you know we're never going to you're never going to get rid of obesity we're just going to learn to manage it and i think it also helps us as providers kind of get our heads wrapped around what our goals are with this when it comes to treatment this is no zero sum game it's all three things together for certain patients of ours behavior surgery and medications like just like it is for other chronic illnesses so now we're going to break this down a little bit. I've been saying that there's improvement. So let's talk about these improvements in each of these areas because they're significant and they're really honestly quite exciting. So behavior, this is, you know, this is what we've always used for obesity, um, behavioral interventions, um, but there's some new things to it. And I think there are ways that we're becoming a little bit more sophisticated. First off, we have a question for you. Um, motor question, the question is, motivational interviewing is the preferred counseling style for dealing with most weight loss efforts, including binge eating disorder. Is this true or false? So the answer to this is, it is false. And we'll, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't give my chance, time to vote there. You can answer all three of these if you like at this time. Emily, I'll let you tell me when we're um, when we're ready to move on. I'll let everybody answer all three because we're going to answer we're going to go over each of these as we go through the sections. So as I said, the answer to our first question here is false. Um, motivational interviewing is not typically used for um, use in patients with um, binge eating disorder. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about motivational interviewing here in just a second. But a quick aside first, that weight bias and weight stigma, I think are things that have really held us back in the past. And I think we're finally beginning to turn the tide on this one. You can define weight bias and weight stigma as negative attitudes and, and beliefs about others because of weight. Um, it's really something that I think we all know that we need to get away from. I'm really glad that it has come to the forefront because it's a very counterproductive um, approach to have trying to shock people into losing weight. And I think a lot of us did that early. I know I did that early on when I was trying to help patients. I was actually shaming them um, by trying to, you know, harp about what, you know, what was happening with them and, 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 and how they got into this situation. Um, I think it really, it really is very harmful. Um, one of the things I, I'm trying to bring up with this slide is to say that your resources are out there. If you notice, these are pictures from the Rudd Center at the University of Connecticut that are public domain pictures. Um, and rather than having pictures of people, um, you, you know, sitting on a couch eating Doritos, which I've seen in public health campaigns here in Cincinnati in an effort to try to get people shocked into doing something. Um, this is, you know, people actually with weight issues um, participating in daily activities. And they have pictures of kids, of adults, of um, regardless of gender, ethnicity, et cetera, really great resources, but you have resources. And I think that's a major advance. I think we are really beginning to be more sensitive about our patients and being able to not play the blame game with them. Um, I'd also say that motivational interviewing is growing up a bit. We used to say, you know, I, I, I think we, we, there used to be these statements about like, well, motivational interviewing, and I do a lot of training in motivational interviewing. I love it. Um, but I also think we sometimes expected too much out of it. We, we said, you know, like you can do behavior change, 
um, uh, yeah, it's it, 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 much harder than a chameleon changing its colors, um, but you can do behavior change um, uh, by using motivational interviewing. Well, you can do part of it. And what I mean by this is we really know that behavior change is very nonlinear. It goes back and forth. Sometimes it's on the top of your list. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you have a hard day and the behavior change is harder to, to, to stick with. Um, we also know that motivational interviewing is non-judgmental, as we just mentioned. It's very important that you know uh, you're not trying to cajole people into it or prescribe. We know that behavior change is patient-driven. Um, it's less time-bound. Motivational interviewing isn't going to get you everywhere. It's one tool, and it's what you use when you're working on the why for behavior change. So I think when I say motivational interviewing is growing up, what I'm driving at is to say that this is the why of behavior change. When you're trying, you don't use motivational interviewing at all times under every circumstance. You use motivational interviewing when you're trying to do the why of behavior change. Why is this important for me? Why is this important for my health? Why is this the right time to do something? We also use a lot more shared decision making now. And I think that, you know, this is something that we're pretty good at as pediatricians. We do a lot of shared decision making. You know, when we're talking about is this an ear infection? How would you like to treat this? Let's talk about it for a family. We're doing it right now all the time with like what kind of testing are we going to do for COVID? Um, we do a lot of shared decision making and trying to kind of reach a middle ground. We're good at this uh, as pediatric medical providers. And it's really, I think, a bigger piece of weight management and as well. It uses a lot of the skills that we have that we've developed over time. It leverages a lot of our skill with the five A's with self-management. So I really, you know, I, I kind of make this transition when we're using motivational interviewing from the why, this is really the how. Like, you know, I really kind of flop into those into these sort of skills. And there's a difference between shared decision-making and motivational interviewing. Um, and self-management is just one piece of shared decision-making. Decision but I think really bringing shared decision-making into the equation is really important when we talk about chronic disease. And it's part of our thinking about obesity as a chronic disease when we use shared decision-making. I could go into things forever on shared decision-making and motivational interviewing, but obviously we can't do that in an hour discussion. So then we get, what other ad advances have we had? You know, I used to say that we had, yeah, I just said we had one tool. We just didn't know exactly what to say, but we had a tool, eat less, exercise more. Well, there are a lot of things out there. There are a lot of different approaches to, to managing it. We can do things in, on an individual basis, maybe in your office, which is one of my personal crusades, um, we can do things that are hospital-based in certain places. We can do things, we can interact with places that have commercial programming, some of which is really good and really high quality. Um, there are some really strong community programs that are circulating out there that have good outcomes. We can also um, uh, really let the patients sort of decide what's gonna work for them. Um, you know, this is one of those ones where I hear people talk a lot about uh, intermittent fasting. And, um, you know, there are ways, you know, there's, there's a kernel of truth in all of these programs. Um, and I always am saying to families that the nutrition program that's going to work is the one that you, works for you, the one that you can follow. None of them work if you can't follow them. So this is really the what. So motiv motivational interviewing, if we think about it in a more sophisticated way as the why and shared decision making is the how, this is the what. This is the what you're actually going to um, uh, what you're actually going to do. Um, and I feel like those things have to follow in that order sequentially. I'm um, having said that there are a lot of different options out there. I do think it's also important to remember the deluge of things that your patients are being bombarded with and things that really do not have a lot of science behind them. Um, you know, there, there are certain ones, the one that drives me absolutely bonkers at times is the plant paradox diet, which tells you not to eat beans and tomatoes because of lectins, which um, I really, 
I really have a hard time with this one. <laughs> there are other ones that I have a hard time with too, like certain certain um, supplements that just do not have a lot of science behind them. Um, there's also the um, food combination diet. I don't know if you can see this one. It's the third one. I'll kind of circle my arrow on it right here, where it the, the principle here is that you have to eat things together, and there's some sort of theory that they interfere with each other, other's absorption. At any rate, just be careful. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there. There's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of flexibility for your families, but you're also going to encounter a lot of things that don't have a lot of science behind them. Where is the science? Um, things that really do use eating plans that are based in a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, and um, a, a good variety. Uh, these are things like the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and the MIND diet, which is a fusion of the Mediterranean and DASH diets, they all have certain things that make them better or worse. But bottom line is good nutrition, good portioning, um, and a variety of foods, not heavy in any one group. Um, it's, you know, it's not rocket science on a certain level, but then there's also ways of approaching it. You know, I think a lot of different plans We'll use cognitive behavioral therapies. We'll use um, strategies around timing um, that are helpful for certain patients that you can do without a lot, with, in a very safe way. I'd also like to make a little word about prevention in this area when we're talking about behavior, because this is an area where we're really making some progress. Um, progress in feeding pra and practice has come from a lot of places. Um, a little bit of a shout out to the INSIGHT study by NIH, um, also from the Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight at AAP, and a good old standard, the Ellen Satter Institute on um, feeding practice. Um, these places have really helped us understand some things that help with um, acceptance of foods and help with obesity prevention. And what are these things that these three places are pushing? It's basically responsive feeding, where we're really paying attention to kids' cues, you know, where this is really getting away. And there's good data from these places that we need to get away from the uh, clean plate club sort of mentality um, that parents need to um, respond to infant signals for hunger or satiety, that they recognize those cues and respond promptly, and that the child figures experiences a predictable response to the signals. Ellen Satter has always said this as the parents provide the what and when, healthy foods at predictable times, the kids determine the how much and even if. So kids, you also will hear this as Parents provide, kids decide. So it's not that, you know, like, okay, this is my child who is, you know, at the 10th percentile BMI just turned down um, uh, the healthy food I gave them. So I'm going to go make chicken nuggets right now. It's empowering patients, empowering families to respond to their kids and letting their kids declare, like, you know, what, I'm not hungry right now. Um, and that's an important uh, thing for kids to be able to have autonomy over. Um, a lot of this research has some good pearls for us to take home. What makes it hard for parents to hear and act on healthy messages? Um, they really don't like, we now know parents really don't like obesity language, especially when we relate it to infants. Um, and this has changed. I did a focus group years and years ago, and parents in that focus group actually said, use the word obesity, but tell us what you mean by it. It's really, I think the times have changed. Um, and it's become so supercharged that really the use of the word obesity is, it's not verboten, but you have to use it very carefully. Guidance with, it, that's focused too much on future outcomes is not well received. Limited knowledge of recommendations that you're, you're making um, and that they have is also help, uh, is unhelpful. So if they make vague generalizations, um, that kind of is hard for families, understandably. Um, and when there's a disconnect between what you're telling them and what their personal experience is, that was made it hard for parents. What makes it easier for them is when the provider respects their 
ex particular expertise. So when you can reframe things that they want to do um, in ways that are helpful, for example, a family that is feeding a, a child juice, it's not don't feel that feed that child juice. It's it sounds like getting fruits and vegetables are an important aspect for you. Let's figure out a way that maybe we can do that in a better way. Um, explaining the why behind recognition re recommendations without overdoing it is helpful. Um, actionable strategies help like very concrete, very specific goals for them and tailoring to their lifestyle and their child's needs are important. So we know a lot more now than we used to about what makes behavior change more acceptable. So let's talk about surgery. So our journey continues over time and things became more available for us. Um, one of the, 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 the question I just put in there was the new AAP and a, 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 a Society for Mer Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Guidelines for Bariatric Surgery set a lower limit of 14 years for performing bariatric surgery. The answer to this question is also false. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but what happened with obesity for our families? Well, there was a growing body of evidence because there were some really great studies, three biggies in particular. AMOS, which came out of Scandinavia, the FABS-5 multi-center trial, and also a bigger one called Teen Labs um, that um, was based in Cincinnati, Columbus, Houston, Pittsburgh, um, Colorado, a um, couple of other sites as well. Um, but Teen Labs really demonstrated that for patients with severe obesity, surgery, bariatric surgery, either ruin wide gastric bypass or gastric sleeve really could be the standard of care. These kids had really good outcomes. They would lose a third of their body weight um, pretty reliably and pr keep pretty much of it off. Um, it became sort of a standard of care um, for people saying like, this is really the way we help kids with severe obesity. Those kids who would present us, those sickest of the sick, that we had nothing to do for them. It really, these three studies really demonstrated that we do have something we can do and something we should be doing for them. Um, surgeons and pediatricians began to follow the standard, um, but there was a lot of pushback from society, media, and most importantly, from insurance and the medical community against this procedure. Um, people really were like saying, this seems, seems uh, too drastic. This seems, irre this is irreversible. What are we doing, doing surgery on kids that have um, um, these issues? And so there really became sort of this um, um, patients not receiving what a, a procedure that could really help them out. And it became pretty obvious that there was an urgent need for statements from the American Academy of Pediatrics and from the Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery that we needed to say something about bariatric surgery in children. So for those of you who know, the timeline for an AAP policy statement moves at the speed of a glacier because this is the um, route that you have to follow. This is the flow chart that every policy statement will follow. And it's, it's a long one. Um, it takes years. Um, we got cracking on it. And fortunately, we came out with a pretty, what we feel like is a really good um, uh, set of uh, papers, both a policy statement and a technical report that came out a couple of years ago um, on um, metabolic and bariatric surgery in pediatrics. Um, what does the policy statement really recommend? Well, it goes to a bunch of different levels. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to kind of know because we're the, we're the people who are going to be advising folks about this. Um, the policy statement recommends that we should recognize severe obesity as greater than BMI greater than 35 or a new measure for severe obesity that, that we should all be comfortable with, which is being greater than 120% of the 95th percentile BMI for age and sex, age and gender. Um, or age and sex, I should say. So it's, it's 
you know, th this de definition, it's whichever is lower. So, because what we were getting into was as you get to certain younger age groups, they won't still won't have a BMI over 35, but they will be greater than the 120% of the 95th percentile BMI. So that you use the lower mark on that. Um, you want, so first off, you want to recognize these kids. You want to recognize that severe obesity places them for certain comorbidities. Um, you, we, as on a practice level, on an individual level, we should be seeking high quality multidisciplinary centers for the assessment and possible scheduling of bariatric surgery. Um, we should understand the efficacy risks and benefits and implications of the procedures. Um, we should be able to coordinate preoperative and postoperative care. And we should also be able to monitor them postoperatively for basic nutritional deficiencies. Not everything, but we should be there for um, uh, general pediatricians, pediatric medical providers should be able to, to do the basics with these patients, recognize them, refer them where they need to go, and be able to monitor them after the procedure. For pediatricians on the system level, we need to advocate for increased access for pediatric patients. Um, kids, particularly in racial and ethnic and uh, minorities and kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds have lower access to these services. Um, having worked in the uh, uh, system at Cincinnati Children's, um, it seemed like the vast majority of our patients, I shouldn't say vast majority, but a, a, major, a majority of our patients came from Eastern Kentucky. Um, where um, rates for severe obesity are at their very highest um, and patients really suffer a lot and, and face a lot of adversity in trying to access care. So there's a lot of barriers that we as pediatricians and pediatric medical providers need to be aware of. For government health and academic centers on the system level, um, we should be they should be advocating for best practice guidelines to support multidisciplinary centers. Um, and, cons and consider the health benefits over other sorts of um, unsubstantiated kind of concerns. Basically, follow the science. Um, right now, there are a lot of arbitrary, there were a lot of arbitrary statements before this policy came out saying nobody under age 12, nobody under age 14. And really, we need to look at the health benefits of the procedure. Um, and really the call from the statement is for government and health and academic centers to increase the number of uh, places that can do bariatric surgery and the number of places that um, are, have expertise in it. For insurers, they need to pay for it. Uh, they need to support it. They need to um, appropriately not put up barriers and they need to let people get better. Um, and that needs to be for the workup and all the way through care afterwards. Um, you know, the, one of the big differences I think between pediatric bariatric centers and adult bariatric centers is the preparation that goes into it and the follow-up that comes afterwards. Um, you'll see a lot of variability with adults, but in kids in general, they have really good follow-up, the places that do this procedure, and it needs to be done that way. Um, and we also made a call for public and private insurers to really reduce these barriers that have been erected. So what does a policy statement recommend that you should, when you should not do this? Um, if there's a medically correctable cause for obesity, you know, if, if they have hypothyroidism or if there's something else that we can address. Um, if there's an ongoing substance abuse problem within the preceding year, um, if there are cognitive reasons not to do this. Now, I will tell you that, you know, there are certain patients who have some cognitive impairment who are suffering greatly from severe obesity and should not be denied the, this, this procedure as well. So um, I think that we, we need to be careful with this one in that we don't want to exclude people who really deserve, um, deserve to be helped. Um, if there's current or planned pregnancy within 12 to 18 months of the procedure, that is also a contraindication. And again, missing in this list of contraindications, no age exclusion. So, you know, why was there no age exclusion? Because there really the data did not demonstrate that there needed to be an age exclusion. Not that we're saying that this should be done on kids down to age five, but if you look at the studies that were done, some of these came from places where they were done on younger kids, seven and eight year olds. Um, with good outcomes. Um, those were done in, in um, uh, the Middle East and some of the Gulf states. 
So what are the high points when it comes to bariatric surgery for us as pediatric medical providers? We need to focus on disparities and be alert to them. We need to know how to evaluate, identify, and counsel about these procedures. We need to uh, know how to measure it. We need to know how to define it and evaluate it by using the new, the, the 120, 120% of the 95th percentile. Um, we need to know how to get to bariatric surgery centers um, and there's a scarcity of them. Um, we need to eliminate arbitrary exclusion criteria and we need to reduce barriers. Medications, the next frontier. It always amazes me too when people are going like, well, you know, I think I'd rather do medication rather than leaping to surgery. And I think that sounds great, but I'm also gonna say we know a lot less about medications than we do surgery. Um, it's getting better, but we know a lot less. So I didn't see the, what, how people answered on this one, on the true or false, but liraglutide or Saxenda is the first and currently only medication approved for weight loss in teens. And the answer to this question is false. Actually, the first one was Orlistat, also known as Zenical or Ally. Um, this is a medication that's been around for a while. Um, it inhibits gastric and pancreatic lipases that limit fat absorption. Um, it's approved down to age 12, actually, um, and it's mostly limited by side effects. So those of you, if you've taken this, um, and um, I have to admit, you know, being in this role, I thought, you know what, I'm going to see what my patients experience on this medication. It can be tough. Um, there can be a lot of problems with um, diarrhea. Um, it works for certain patients. It is, it is proven. It is helpful for certain patients. Um, it, and its side effects are mostly inconvenient ones of loose stools, um, uh, but it, is, it, it works for certain patients. It just, like I say, it just, it's tough for certain patients because they'll have um, these gastrointestinal side effects that are, that are at, at best inconvenient and at worst stigmatizing. Um, so it's got a, it's got a use, um, and it's been around for a while. Um, so it was actually the first one. The second one, and the one that we've very, been very excited about lately, has been the approval of liraglutide, um, which is Saxenda when used for weight loss, or Victoza when it is used for um, control of type 2 diabetes. So what is this doing? So what Saxenda does is it activates glucagon-like peptide number one or GLP-1. Okay, that's nice. So what does that mean? It means that it does several things. From a, uh, from a type two diabetes issue, the use for it with Victoza, it increases insulin secretion, it decreases glucagon secretion um, and delays gastric emptying. So what these things tend to do is they tend to stabilize glucose. I'm sure the endocrinologists in our crowd are cringing as I'm trying to describe this, but you know I'm I'm doing it. I'm doing my best as a general pediatrician, but basically it has a, the 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 thing that we're looking for with um, our weight loss patients. What we see with our weight loss patients, we 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 see a decrease in um, uh, appetite regulated centrally. And we don't know, but we think it's through brain GLP-1 receptors that rat regulate appetite and caloric intake. Um, so that's the effect that we're looking for primarily, although these other things certainly have an impact on our patients um, uh, with their, with their um, um, appetite. Um, and certainly delaying gastric emptying is also gonna affect appetite on a certain level. Um, it's approved down to age 12 and in older, 12 and older in patients with severe obesity. Again, the same guidelines that we use for patients who are eligible or we think should be recommended for possible bariatric surgery. Um, it is contraindicated in patients and families with medullary thyroid carcin carcinoma or multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type two, so MEN type two, um, due to an increased risk of uh, exacerbating those illnesses. A word about metformin. So a lot of us will use um, metformin um, in patients who have demonstrated insulin resistance. 
It's not officially a weight loss uh, medication. Um, it's limited use, but it's important when used in patients on atypical antipsychotics. So the Invegas, the Risperdals, the Seroquels of the world. So when these medications are started, um, uh, th this is a medication that has indications to, to be started probably pretty close to the same time. Um, so it, it, metformin, again, has some limitations with its um, uh, acceptance because it will cause some stomach upset. Um, and you have to start off low at low doses and slowly increase it. Um, but it has some effort, some ability, obviously, in reducing some insulin resistance. So you'll see metformin used in certain circumstances as well. A few words about ADHD treatment. As I mentioned, I was not going to be using off-label um, uh, uh, indications for these medications, and I am not, um, but I am going to talk about the importance of treating ADHD. Um, Vyvanse is, is approved for use in patients with diagnosed binge eating disorder, many of whom also have severe obesity. Um, but I'd also say that ADHD is often about impulsivity um, to the point where when I'm talking with patients with ADHD, we talk about impulsivity being a big piece of of ADHD, it really should be in the name. It should be attention deficit with or without hyperactivity, with or without impulsivity um, uh, disorder. Um, so a lot of time, in some ways, there's nothing more impulsive than eating. Um, so I feel the patients who, are, who have ADHD, you need to manage their ADHD. You're not using the medication, to, intent is very important here. You're not using the medication for weight loss. You're using the medication to control ADHD symptoms. If some of that is impulsive behavior around eating, some of that is impulsive behavior around eating. Um, you treat ADHD like you would other behavioral health diagnoses. I've actually had patients, I've actually had physicians say to me like, oh, well, I have a patient with obesity, but they've really got ADHD. You know, but we can't use this for Medicaid for, for controlling weight. I'm like, well, you're not using it to control weight. You're using it to control their ADHD. And I know it's, it's, it sounds like I'm parsing things, but it's really about intent, um, about what you're trying to do. And you're really trying to treat the ADHD. So on the horizon for kids, there's a lot. Um, there's semaglutide, um, which, is, which is heading through a lot of trials currently. Um, to pyramate, uh, Topamax, um, it, you know, uh, was noted certainly in our patients with seizure disorder for them that they had some weight loss with it and some appetite suppression. There are trials using to pyramate, there are trials using fentramine. These are all medications that are used in adults. Um, we think that there's some, some possibilities for these in the future for kids. Um, and who knows what else is out there. Um, there are definitely some other GLP-1 agonists that are um, in, in, the, um, in the launch pad somewhere. Um, so this really leads the question too about these things is what about all these other diagnoses that are managed with pharmacology that can lead to unweighted, unwanted weight gain, things like depression, anxiety, um, and other eating disorders, treat them. You know, this is, falls in this category when I mentioned it briefly about having another medically manageable um, illness. These things need to be treated and treated aggressively. Um, in these cases, obesity and severe obesity is a, side, is a byproduct of these other illnesses. We need to treat them and we need to treat them aggressively. Um, there is a ton more on this topic on using medications to treat um, obesity. And in my mind, there's one place to go if you want more on this topic. This course um, run by Claudia Fox and Aaron Kelly um, at the University of Minnesota on advanced therapies for pediatric obesity is dynamite. It's probably the only place that really goes over the use of medications in the treatment of obesity to, to a detailed level. Um, and they're, they are masters of helping people understand how to use these medications safely, how to use these medications effectively. Um, so there's a lot more out there. And in, if you're interested, this, in my mind, is the place to go. Interestingly, it's just in a few weeks here, um, but they do it every year. 
Um, this year it's all virtual. Um, it's, it's really nice to interact with them uh, in person. But if you're looking for more, I would strongly encourage you to check out this one. So good news, um, a true guideline is coming. The new, this time it's really a guideline, meaning it's based on a number of studies. Um, we have reviewed hundreds um, of studies and high hundreds of studies um, that have been done over the last couple of, year, couple of decades, honestly, um, on what works with behavior, what works with um, multidisciplinary centers. Um, a guideline is on its way. It's completely focused on treatment. It is not focused on evaluation. It's focused on evaluation, certainly, too, but it's really focused on treatment. That's what was really revised. It's not about prevention. That will come in a separate topic. There's just not enough data on that one to do a guideline on prevention yet. But this one is really focused on what works. Um, it's expected by the beginning of summer or the end of spring. It's in its final phases of review, just like the glacial pace that our um, uh, bariatric surgery statement came through. This guideline is going riding down that same glacier, but we are mercifully in our final phases of review. So we'll, you'll expect to see something shortly and I will be doing a jig when that happens. So fitting this all together, you know, it's up to us as primary care providers in pediatrics to know what's out there in pediatrics, to be up on the latest behavioral to be up on, on what it means where bariatric surgery fits into this illness, where medications will fit in now and in the future. It's up for us to really use our pediatric specialists, especially those cardiologists who are putting on today's conference um, who really know what they're doing. It's important for us to really um, get our group of obesity care specialists positioned around the places. Because as you notice, I'm saying we need to use these obesity care specialists. Well, number one, they need to be there. We need to have them. Um, and we need them hospital-based. And I think we also need some people out there who do this in their primary care offices. Um, you know, we have obesity like ADHD, like other, like other behavioral health issues, like asthma. Sometimes we need a practice champion or someone who can actually provide a little bit higher level. In my practice, what we do, myself, um, one of our nurse practitioners and one of our PAs, we run a program called Fit Kids and Fit Kids and Teens, that's, an, that's a specific carve out that's done during our day, not a specific time of day or, or day of the week or anything because of our patient schedules, but we kind of designate it in separate for our other partners to refer to us to the Fit Kids and Teens so we can actually manage them in our office. And we also need to continue to work with all of our dedicated tech colleagues who are pharmacists, dietitians, athletic trainers, PTs, OTs, respiratory therapists, we need them all because this is an illness that really affects every organ system in every way imaginable. And we need them all helping and pulling with us. So with no further ado, I'd like to open things up to questions. Uh, we covered a ton of, ton of uh, territory there and see what people have. Oh, great question. So Lisa Klein asks, what is the neurodegenerative delay in the context of the DASH program from the previous slide? Um, I have, um, I do not know. I don't know that answer. Um, Deb, do you know the answer to that by chance? I, I do not, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know, you know, our cardiologists are, are uh, you know, it, it's, um, um, it, it's listed as a possible side effect, but I do not know. I'll have to look that up. Dr. Bowling, that was an excellent talk, actually. I find, you know, as a, as a heart surgeon, it's something I'm not as familiar with. I deal with the after effects of, of obesity, but um, it was, I found it very interesting. I actually have two questions for you. One is in regards to bariatric surgery. Is Do you know how common it is for that to be done in the pediatric population, or is that still something that, you know, people talk about but aren't necessarily willing to do yet? You know, it's really picking up, honestly, Deb. I think I think the statement has helped a lot. The debate is always, <clears throat> do you do this at a pediatric center that, you know, by necessity, pediatric centers don't do it enough to get like this, this level where they say that they're like a center of excellence kind of thing? Um, or do you do it at a place <clears throat> that does more of them? Um, 
I think, you know, I, I'm always biased to going to a pediatric center. It still is pretty sparse, you know, and, and part of, there's definitely been an uptick. Um, the last numbers that I've seen on it, I want to say, oh my gosh, I can't even remember what the last numbers were. They've gone up um, approximately about by 50% each year over the last eight to 10 is what I want to say. So it's gone up and more places are doing it. Um, I know that um, uh, just from very anecdotal experience here in Cincinnati, um, they're kind of at capacity. I mean, it's a waiting list to do it now. Um, you know, also just from personal experience, we used to have, we have maybe five or six patients in different states of evaluation in our, in our practice right now. So. Do, do you know what, you know, how well they do into adulthood? After. Yeah, yeah. So the results on teen labs um, go out now about um, ten years, and those patients tend to lose. Like I say, the, the, one of the messages from the statement is refer people sooner rather than later because you, no matter where you start, you're going to lose about thirty your body weight. So if you start at four hundred, you're only going to get down, you know, to just the below three hundred. Um, if you start at three hundred, you get down to two hundred. So, um, but those people lose about a third, and then they regain back up to where they about. In most cases, they seem like they maintain about a 25% loss. Oh, okay. Um, and there was another question that was asked about if you know whether or not pediatric advanced nurse practitioners are participating in care for these patients. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, the, one of the people like our, in my practice, we have um, a pediatric nurse practitioner and a PA who run our in-office stuff. N NPs and PAs are really involved um, in surgical evaluation. They're involved in medications uh, on our listservs. We have NPs and PAs who are doing obesity care all the time. Um, I think some of the people who have, who run some of the best programs are NPs and PAs. Okay. Absolutely. And then another question was, how frequently do you order physical therapy for weight loss in the context of your obese patients? So physical therapy, you know, I think, you know, extra, I, I guess that's in the sense of like, do you do, I, 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 maybe some clarification, is it do for, are you doing that for their exercise program? Um, or are you doing for specific comorbidities? I mean, certainly physical therapy is really important when our patients, because these patients have a lot of orthopedic complications. They have Blount's disease or bowing of the tibia. They have back pain. So I think physical therapy, absolutely, we refer for that. Our, phys our physical therapists actually participate in a lot of the exercise programs, like the exercise component of HealthWorks at Cincinnati Children's has a couple of physical therapists who are in there. So I think in the context, you can't just make like a referral to physical therapy for weight loss. Um, but you can definitely make, I definitely do it for particular comorbidities and they're definitely involved in different exercise programs. Okay. And then one last question, um, pediatric obesity, especially in our heart failure patients who require a ventricular assist device has been very challenging. And there's a lot of discussion regarding before we put a VAT in these patients, how do we manage the obesity? Um, and would you do bariatric surgery to help manage their obesity prior to heart failure, uh, VAD placement? Do you see any recommendations coming for this population? I do not. But that is why that, that kind of question is exactly, exactly why I think this, this procedure belongs more in pediatric centers than it does in bariatric centers of excellence. I think that, you know, that's those kind of pediatric questions, our, our kids are so different and have so many other comorbidities that belongs on a multidisciplinary discussion. We've had, you know, we have ones that, you know, we, some of our kids with Down syndrome, some of our kids with other genetic disorders, those are some of the most confusing and debated patients we have. Awesome. Well, Dr. Bowling, thank you so much for joining us. It was excellent. My pleasure.